Hey there, today I have 20 questions for a pilot. I have been married to my husband who is a major airline pilot for over 20 years. And in this video, he's going to share his juicy secrets to his exciting airline pilot job for the questions that you have asked him. He answers questions about flight delays and then gets into some of the nitty gritty job title description that he has as a pilot throughout his career. Since this interview, I've gotten a haircut and my fallopian tubes cut and removed, and now I have mental energy, and I thought of one secret that many passengers do not know, and so that is who flies the airplane. When your airplane gets up in the air and you hear the first officer say, it is now safe to unbuckle your seatbelts, that means that he is not the one flying the airplane during that part of the trip. When you land and then you get up in the air again and a captain is talking and he says, hi, this is your captain, welcome aboard. He is the one who is manning the microphone and communication systems and the first officer will be the one who is flying the airplane. So each of them has to be prepared, trained and qualified to fly the plane all by themselves. Basically, they just switch off per leg of the flight. Okay, so are you ready? <laughs> All right, what do you dislike most about your job? Uh, I Like everyone, we don't like to be delayed because we have lives we want to go home to and stuff. So I would say delays are the biggest part I dislike about my job. And are you in control of any of those delays? Not usually. I mean, we want to fly airplanes. So a lot of times it's weather or technology or just... Um, the plane's late arriving that we can't take it to leave. So we don't like delays either. All right. Do you feel like a traditional college degree is required or necessary with flying lessons or a certain flight school that they should go to? Aviation industry right now is in a very uh, good position for pilots. They, they're in high demand. Uh, so normally I would tell people you don't really need a college degree anymore. That's uh, how in need the pilot or the airlines are but I always encourage people because it's a very cyclical business and it's kind of tied to the rest of the world economy to always maybe go the traditional route to get a degree so you have something to fall back on should you not be able to fly. So he has a really good memory and he remembers like all the mechanical stuff about uh a lot of the mechanical makeup of airplanes and what makes them fly. Oh, what kind of degree did you get? I got a, a degree in aeronautical technology, which is basically like an aeronautical engineering degree with not all the design and the heavy math. So you first went to school to do what? Uh, what did you think? Originally, I thought you had to be an engineer to be a pilot. And then I realized that there's a lot of universities in the United States that have a flying program where they teach you the basics of airplanes, the basics of how airplanes fly, and then also give you classes in airline management and stuff like that, all this while you're getting your ratings to be a pilot. Has it always been your dream to be a pilot? And how did you end up being a pilot? Hi from Brazil. <laughs> it is, it's something that I've always been fascinated with large, taking a large machine like in a jetliner and bring it into the air and placing it down somewhere else. and. My mom used to tell me that the Fisher Price airplane was the one I played with the most. So I think it was just embedded in me from a long time ago. All right, and then tell them what your mom did when you were a child, an older child. Uh, was... When I was in my teens, like 12, 13. Oh, I thought it was when you were in elementary school. It was, okay. yeah, it was around there, but uh, I used to want to go watch airplanes. So she would drop me off at the airport and I would go on top of the parking garage with my little aviation radio and watch the airplanes land and take off. Then I'd go down in the terminal, have lunch, and then at a designated time, because we didn't have cell phones, she would come pick me up at the airport. Um, granted, this is a long time ago where it was much safer to leave kids alone. Um, and then she would just come pick me up and take me home. All right, what's your take on pilots updating the passengers and speaking on the microphone? Uh, well, you know, I, really encourage pilots to update the pastors as much as possible. I think most pastors are understanding that aviation is not a perfect form of transportation and we're going to run into delays, whether it be weather or mechanical or issues like that. But most people are trying to go somewhere to do something. So if we can provide the best guess as to when we're going to leave and when we're going to get there, then people in business, for example, can reshuffle appointments or meetings, change the Uber pickup time. So I do really feel 
that it is important that we update our pastors as much as we can. Something that he told me is that is it makes sense that a lot of pilots like to just fly airplanes. They are very nervous about talking in front of people. So although we think it's so helpful and should be required, not all pilots enjoy do, doing that. Right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Um, have you ever met celebrities or politicians while flying? Uh, I have flown both. Uh, I, I don't remember. I have a list somewhere, but um, we're not... We, we usually don't disclose who we're flying publicly. So. <laughs> and then would you ever consider being a personal pilot or a private pilot? For a corporate pilot, uh, probably not right now. One of the benefits of being in an airline is it's very regularly scheduled, so I can plan my life around when I'm going to be home, when I'm going to go to work. And a lot of times if you're a corporate pilot, you work at the discretion of the owner. So... You could have a day off and then the owner changes his mind and wants to go to Brazil tomorrow. So I do prefer the scheduled side of an airline. All right. And what are your thoughts on the smaller airplanes? We're talking about like the 25 seat and the 50 and... Or a family airplane, airplane plane, like a privately owned. They're all fine. Okay. Um, it just depends on the person flying it. So if you, uh, if you own your own airplane, then you have to train yourself or get some training to fly into a different environment than flying in an in a air, airline environment. Mm -hmm. The airline has standard operating like lists that every pilot has to follow and check off before you fly, right? Mm -hmm. And so that means if you just follow the steps and check the safety things, <laughs> everything should just be peachy. So with turbulence, um, sometimes you feel like you're dropping, like on those smaller planes, it's safe, right? Turbulence is normal? How would you uh, describe it? Turbulence is not, I mean, we don't like it, but turbulence is just, it's part of the weather system. Uh, weather varies day to day in all parts of the world. And so usually where you have some differences in weather, high pressure, low pressure, you're gonna get some kind of turbulence. We've come a long way in technology. We have lots of apps on our iPads now that we have up on the flight deck that help us predict turbulence. Or now we have it where the iPad can detect turbulence and then report it out to all the other iPads in the area that have the same software. So we can try to get a little notice that there's turbulence ahead. Is there more turbulence going a certain way or like over Denver, Colorado, for example? Turbulence varies with where the jet stream is and the jet stream is usually higher in the summer or you know, more north in the summer and further south in the winter. And wherever the, wherever the high winds hit something like mountains, like in the Rockies, you're going to have increased levels of turbulence. So uh, there is no particular direction flying where it's going to be better. It just depends on the day and where the jet stream is. And it's normal. Yes. It doesn't mean the plane's going to break in half. Correct. I don't care for it. How many of you, when you feel turbulence, you look at a pilot who's traveling in the back of the airplane or deadheading? Um, you look at them like, are they nervous? What's going on? That's what I do. <laughs> and then would you mind describing the, what the cockpit looks like? We have one viewer, several viewers, um, but her daughter is blind. So when you walk in, you're going to see two seats. Um, and in front of those two seats are panels that tell you about basically where the airplane is in relation to the earth. So where the ground is, where the sky is. And then you're going to see all the necessary things we need to fly an airplane. We need to know how fast we're going. We need to go how we are. And we need to go know which heading on a compass we're flying. And those, you'll see screens on each side in front of each pilot. So there's one for the captain, one for the first officer. And then in the middle between us is all the indications about the engines on the airplane. How much power they're producing, how fast they're spinning, oil pressure, all the things you have in your car. And then overhead of us is a panel that is a little bit more detailed than a car, but it's going to basically split out the different systems on the airplane, the uh, air conditioning system, the hydraulic system, the electrical system, and so on. Most airlines will not entertain interviewing, a, a major airline will not interview until a pilot has at least 1,500 hours of flying time. Uh, but it, once again, that depends on the market. And so... Uh, back when airlines weren't in huge need of pilots, they would maybe look for someone who had 7,000 hours. But now because the market is so neat, that number is going to naturally just come down okay. based on and, demand. And does that mean that's unsafe if nope. they have fewer hours? They just have less experience, but they still have to go through our approved training program. 
Okay. So by by the FAA in the United States, we're required to be go to training at least once every twelve months. Um, my company does it every nine months, and then I also have some online training I'm required to complete every quarter. All right. Now uh, you're only required to, or you can only work how many hours? I can't fl be scheduled to fly more than eight hours in a day. Okay. And who makes that rule? The FAA does. Okay. So when your flight gets canceled because the crew timed out or something like that, don't blame the airline, blame the FAA. <laughs> and why are they saying that? Because of safety. It's all for you. <laughs> oh, and then what kind of planes have you flown and what are your, uh, what would you love to fly? Which one has been your favorite so far and why? <laughs> and why? <laughs> I know why. I've flown about seven different types of airplanes at this airline, so seven different types of jets. Um, the one I fly now is probably my favorite just because it's the most comfortable mm -hmm. and um, it just is easy to fly. So. And that's what kind of plane is that? It's an Airbus A320. Okay, 320. And we can only fly one airplane at a time. I know that was another question in there. So. Uh, we can't fly multiple types of airplanes at an airline, so uh, we're only only allowed to fly one type at a time. So, when you switch airplanes, that's about a six-week training program where you have to go to the training center and learn how to fly that airplane, and then that's the only one you can fly at that airline. Okay, so when we first were dating, like our first official date, he took me up in a two-seater airplane, flying, and then we had lunch. I mean, I was just going crazy on the inside. So tell them how you proposed to me. Uh, I arranged with a friend of mine to take us on a trip to go fly. And I asked a friend of mine's dad who owned a very large piece of property outside of town if I could borrow his field for the day. And I went to Costco and bought like 12, bag, 12 boxes of trash bags. And I spelled out in trash bags, um, will you marry me on the ground so you could see it from the air. And then my friend and I went and flew over it to see if you could read it and then um, was supposed to take her on a trip the next day, just a sightseeing flight and he was going to fly over it. Yeah, we were going to go have breakfast with this couple like an hour away mm -hmm. and it was completely fogged in. The next morning. So we couldn't. So I went back to my apartment, he went back to his house and I, I was okay, you know, I didn't think anything. And then later he said, it looks like it's going to clear up. You want to meet there after lunch? And I said, sure. So we went flying and then he's like, all right, um, close your eyes. Okay. Do you trust me? And I said, yeah. And then he leaned the plane like this way and he's like, okay, look out the window. And I looked out the window and saw, will you marry me? <gasps> and I, I grab when I'm scared or excited. <laughs> I grab and he said the plane went like this anyway. <laughs> So I thought I'd never have a ring on my finger. So I still think it's super shiny. Okay. Okay. One person says, have you ever had to deal with an unruly passenger or have the flight attendants taken care of it? If we're boarding and we have an unruly passenger, we'll try to solve the problem. Sometimes they're just having a bad day. We'll try to solve the problem outside the airplane. But if it's, uh, if myself and customer service agents feel that this could be roll into something worse in the air, then we'll usually have the passenger taken off the airplane. Okay. Sometimes, I mean, it's nothing to joke about, but this is kind of a funny story. We tell them about the guy who was saying, yes, Captain, yes, yes, that's great news, great news, and how you dealt with that. Well, the passenger in the boarding area was very vocal, uh, very, not, not like uh, a threat at the time. Not ugly. No, but he was very loud. And, was and very so verbal in agreeing right. with whatever you said. And so the customer service I approached and she knew what I was getting ready to ask. And my first thought was he was intoxicated. And she said, I've asked him several questions. I don't think he's intoxicated. Um, and then I asked where he was sitting. Well, he was currently sitting in an emergency exit row. So he would be one that we would need to help out if we had to evacuate the airplane. So I just asked if maybe we could reseat him somewhere else. I just was a little nervous having him right by the emergency exit. Mm -hmm. So she did. Mm -hmm. And then? Then when we got airborne, the flight attendant called and said there's uh, customers are complaining about someone smoking or vaping what smells like marijuana. And sure enough, it was this individual. So. Okay. And he didn't get ugly to, with them, though? No. He just, they took it. Or confiscated it? Nope, they did not. He put it away? No, he did not put it away. So we uh, asked law enforcement to meet the airplane upon our arrival. Okay, did they have to use zip ties or mm. duct tape? Not for something like that. It's, okay. Yeah. All right, from Cruise Tips TV channel, she gives cruise ship trip 
tips <laughs> on YouTube. She wants to know how long are your days and how many flights do you typically complete in a day, I guess. So I normally fly between four day or three day trips. So that would be 15 days a month on average working sprinkled throughout the month. And usually weekends or holidays still. <laughs> <laughs> and I fly on average anywhere between one to three trips a day. How many hours are you allowed to fly before you timed out? That's, oh. That's in a day. Uh-huh, right? right. Eight hours in a day. Uh, I have to have one day off in every seven consecutive days. And the FAA does not let you fly any more than 100, 100 hours in a month and 1,000 hours in a year. So I have heard on smaller airplanes usually a flight attendant would say, folks, we're gonna fly through some thunderstorms, so buckle your seat belts. Like, do you really fly through no. thunderstorms? No. Okay. And that's really the captain's job to be communicating that to the pastors, not the flight okay. attendants. Okay, okay. How long are your layovers, and what are some things that you like to do on layovers? Uh, they vary. My shortest layover is like usually 12 hours, uh, and that's including time from the airport to the hotel and back to the airport. Uh, the longest are 30 something hours, so a day and a half. Okay. And uh, depending on the length of it, um, I usually like to get a workout in on the shortest layover. And if I have a super long layover, sometimes I'll rent a car and go see some tourist sites, or depending on where we're at, or I'll go adventure, to mm -hmm. try some new things, or um, maybe it's a place I've never been to before. And he tries to not eat at chain restaurants Correct. when he's flying and when we're on vacation and stuff. Bathroom breaks during a flight. Mm -hmm. So we have to go to the bathroom like everybody else. <laughs> so um, we arrange breaks with the flight attendants to get us out of the flight deck into the bathroom and back. And then... All right. What's your scariest airport to land in? The scariest? Or the trickiest? I think that this most challenging would be places that are outside the United States. Uh, uh, Canada is fine, but uh, Mexico has a lot of um, uh, older airports. They're, they don't have the best infrastructure like we do in the United States, so sometimes those can be a little challenging along mixed with the language barrier. They're speaking English to you, but Spanish to every other airplane that's uh, in their airspace that's of that country's origin. So sometimes you lose a lot of situational awareness not being able to hear what's going on around you. All right, and then um, one like what makes it challenging does that mean like there's a mountain right before the landing strip and then a mountain right after uh, it's or? either the the geography of the area the altitude of the airport um and then just the amount of airplanes they're trying to squeeze into one piece of pavement say hi hi <laughs> okay what was the weirdest thing that you saw when you were up in the sky I didn't know it at the time, but I later researched it, but we saw a meteor re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so it had this big fireball, almost like a comet, coming in across the sky. And then we asked on the radio, and then the air traffic controller said that he had, he had heard there was a meteor re-entering the atmosphere. I do want to say thank you very much to those of you who have prayed for me and my recovery from my hysterectomy and sent me little hugs and love notes and all that stuff. I really... Really appreciate you caring that much about me. One other question is, have you ever seen a UFO? No. All right, do you know how to get good deals on tickets? I do not. <laughs> Can you explain international flights? So since by law we can't, a pilot cannot fly more than eight hours in a single day, uh, flights that are longer than eight hours, we usually put additional pilots on. So typically an international flight uh, we'll have anywhere from three to four pilots, which usually will consist of either one captain and two first officers, or sometimes two captains and two first officers. And then um, they normally divide up by the length of flight. So if the flight was 10 hours long, each pilot's going to get about a three hour break. Um, and then they'll go back to the crew rest seat, relax, take a nap, eat, read, do whatever, and then come back and then everyone's back in the flight deck for the last 45 minutes of the flight. One other question we have is, do you keep the seatbelt sign on for a longer time after takeoff to help the flight attendants? Because I've thought that same thing. I do not. Uh, I normally, since I don't know what the cruise altitudes are gonna be like, I'll keep it on until we get to our cruise altitude and see what the air is like. And if it's smooth, we'll let them up. And then there are times where I've turned the seatbelt sign on after I turned it off because it was rough. And then I just forgot to turn it off. Yes, they do forget to turn it off. 
All right, what do you pack for travel? We do have a whole video that I'll link in the iCards and in the description box below. You get there by clicking on the first sentence right above the t-shirts that I've designed for people. You'll just click show more or read more and that'll show you information and give you some other uh, travel tip videos. Okay, three more questions. Do you enjoy your job and what is your favorite airplane or what is your goal airplane you wish you could fly one day? I do enjoy my job. Um, I really don't have a particular one that I would just want to have to fly. Mm -hmm. okay. And one other question I forgot about is how do I help him with jet lag? You don't really suffer with jet lag, but he does have to fly all night sometimes. Um, but one thing I do that we've talked about is that I don't schedule like to go to somebody's house or to entertain that night at our house after he's been working. Um, but sometimes if we have a special night, like the, the night that University of Georgia played TCU and beat them, um, it, you know, we might invite people over that night and he would sacrifice for the team. And for me, if that's something that I really wanted him to do, um, I try to give him some quiet time and not tell him everything that happened while he was gone um, and let him check his mail. He loves checking the mail like a lot of pilots or I don't know, a lot of pilots like to do that. Um, and then one final question is, do you know any single pilots? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do anyway. know some single pilots. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, thanks for your time. If you have any other questions, drop them below and I will try to ask him if we have time. All right, thanks again. Bye. Hey there, today I'm answering 20 questions for my pilot who is a husband. <laughs>